From what I understand, the Russians have about 16, 1700 nuclear weapons deployed strategically. And then there's what, like 2,500 in reserves or non-deployed. The US quite similar, I think, you know, you're talking maybe a couple hundred, give or take on either side. China, from what I understand, they had like 270 um, prior to obviously this, this likely proliferation. But most of them, if not all, were non-deployed. Has that shifted completely now? Or what's, what's generally sort of the composition of the three big players? The, uh, the Russians have a very large arsenal of non-strategic nuclear weapons, uh, more than 2,000 uh, compared to the United States, which has a much smaller number. The deployed versus non-deployed thing can get a little technical, right? So technically speaking, China's nuclear arsenal if you use the same arms control counting rules as the US and Russia apply to each other, then yes, most of China's weapons would not be deployed. This is The Global Gambit. So the Indo-Pacific, a term that was coined and has become incredibly universal amongst policymakers, academics and the general public, really, uh, by the late Shinzo Abe uh, before he was uh, assassinated grossly, grossly last year. Um, but the term is encompassing of India and generally sort of the growing importance of this region in international affairs, geopolitics and economics. And as we like to do here on the Global Gambit, we like to look at the nexus of geopolitical risk, economics and foreign policy. My name is Piotr and this is the Global Gambit. If you're new, welcome and consider subscribing if you find the conversation of value. My guest today is, well, there's no way other than I would say he's possibly my favourite commentator, one of my favourites, uh, certainly up there, top three, uh, Ankit Panda. He uh, is uh, a well-known name in the areas of podcasting himself, being uh, the head of the Diplomats uh, podcast, Asian Geopolitics, um, and just generally an expert in nuclear policy as well. He is the Stanton Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment of International Peace, or for International Peace, uh, and is generally an expert on the Asia Pacific uh, and has written many extensive things about Kim Jong-un uh, and also the bomb and survival deterrence in North Korea in, uh, in 2020. So there's a lot here to unpack and the conversation is going to go largely about nuclear policy and doctrine, but also sort of touching upon in the context of the Indo-Pacific. Ankit, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Piotr. Good to be on the show with you. Thank you. Um, so I think the, the best place to start really is uh, just off air. We were talking a little bit about what to really well talk about because there's a lot going on. But I, I would love your broader reactions to um, the Russia strategic partnership with North Korea vis-a-vis -vis obviously what it means for potential nuclear developments uh, of the DPRK's uh, programs and what that means for the sort of Korean Peninsula and uh, broader subregion. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I think that's a good place to start. It's a uh, it's it's a really it's a really big question in many ways, right? There's a lot of uncertainties around where this might go. I mean, I think the big thing to say is that um, proliferation dynamics have really gotten topsy turvy, right? We used to we used to live in a world where the big concern was Russian defense technology or knowledge flowing into North Korea, and uh, now, I mean, the North Koreans are sending ballistic missiles to Russia for use in the front lines of Ukraine. And the big question I think everybody's got on their mind is what kinds of material assistance will the North Koreans receive in return? Mm. Uh, and there's a long list. Uh, and I think we've already seen uh, Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un allude to some of the areas of cooperation. Uh, when they met in person uh, last year uh, in 2023, um, Kim Jong-un traveled to Vladivostok. This was his first trip overseas since North Korea locked itself down during the pandemic, right? It was notable that Kim went to Russia instead of China first, uh, given that <laughs> Xi Jinping in 2018 had actually indicated to Kim that he wanted to be North Korea's primary partner. Uh, but in any case, um, the prospect here is that this is going to increase, I think, North Korea's general confidence in its ability to continue military modernization. Uh, Russia, I think, has really um, shed any previous reluctance to engage with North Korea as a normal country. I think we now have a full-scale strategic partnership between the two countries uh, codified in the treaty that Putin and Kim agreed to earlier this year. That treaty is being submitted to the various um, legal processes in Russia and North Korea. Obviously, in North Korea, it's, it, it's essentially a rubber stamp process as it is in North Korea, um, mm. as it is in Russia, sorry. But um, I think uh, the, the possibilities here are quite concerning, right? I, I don't tend to think that the Russians are going to, for instance, give the North Koreans nuclear warhead design information or, or some of the really, really uh, concerning stuff. But I mean, there's a lot that they can do that can still complicate life for the U.S. and South Korea, right? One example, I think, is air defenses. Uh, North Korea has fairly obsolete air defense capabilities. 
Um, and if they were able to improve those with assistance from Russia, that would significantly complicate military planning for the U.S. and ROK. Uh, but no. I think this is a very significant uh, geopolitical change uh, and I think should affect how the U.S. thinks about policy priorities on the Korean Peninsula and dealing with North Korea more generally. Indeed. And and on the flip side to that, obviously, I think one of the most uh, notable achievements of the Biden administration has been the sort of, I don't know if restoration is too strong a word, but some degree of reapprochement between Japan and South Korea, right? That trilateral summit that they've had and, and generally the two are communicating more because of this uh, deepening of the sort of autocratic axis and what North Korea has been doing respectively. You know, but the thing I think that's concerning keeping in, in with the theme of nuclear elements is that both countries are talking more. I'm not saying it's going to be a some massive policy shift, but there is more open public discourse about the idea of nuclear weapons amongst South Koreans and Japanese citizens and policymakers alike, if I'm if I'm not uh, mistaken, right? What what are you feeling about that? And how Yeah, so I think I think you know the dynamic you're describing is 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 certainly an accurate one. I mean, I'd say there's a difference between Japan and South Korea uh, in terms of public opinion around nuclear matters. Japan, of course, famously has uh, a nuclear allergy that does manifest in public opinion. South Korea is the complete opposite. You have consistently now for a number of years, more than 65, in some cases, 70 percent of the public expressing support for um, nuclear armament. Uh, president Yoon suk yeol uh, the current South Korean president, last year in January, uh, January 2023, uh, openly mooted the possibility of nuclear weapons acquisition as a policy option for the country. He didn't say that South Korea would build nuclear weapons, mm. but he did suggest that it was it was part of a menu of options that Seoul may have to consider. Uh, and so that's pretty remarkable because since the end of the Cold War, the U.S. really hasn't seen too many allies uh, really move in that direction. Uh, and I think there's a lot of um, causes here, right? We know from the literature on the causes of proliferation that domestic politics uh, and a country's security environment are two of the most important variables in promoting an interest in nuclear weapons acquisition. And I think from that vantage point, it's, it's really not surprising that we see this interest in South Korea, right? They have a neighbor to the north that has nuclear weapons, has a very low threshold for using those nuclear weapons, regularly relies on nuclear threats and signaling, and is now building tactical nuclear weapons. And so that has severely, I think, degraded South Korea's perception of its own security environment. At the same time, you do have um, also an alliance, a US ROK alliance, that has gone through a few rocky years, uh, right? Uh, there was, of course, the uh, credibility challenges that the alliance faced under the Trump presidency, where South Korea felt, I think, um, that it was being shaken down a little bit by the United States, right? This was the period when the Trump administration effectively sought to increase five-fold South Korea's contributions to host nation support for the United States. So I think that has also chipped away at um, how, so how many in South Korea, I think, view the reliability of the United States as an ally and a partner. Uh, and then, you know, bringing those two issues together, the North Koreans have also started now um, deploying and, and building fairly reliable intercontinental range ballistic missiles that can hold the U.S. homeland at risk. And so this yeah. was the problem the U.S. once faced during the Cold, um, during the Cold War, where, uh, you know, certain allies, most notably France, um, asked if the U.S. would be willing to trade uh, New York for Paris, right? And I think today the South Koreans are asking if the U.S. would be willing to tr trade San Francisco for Seoul. Um, and, and, and that is really a, um, a development that accompanies North Korea's modernization as well. And look, I mean, the U.S. has been trying to reassure South Korea that fundamentally nothing has really changed for the alliance, that the ICBM capabilities that the North Koreans have built uh, aren't necessarily game changers, but assurance is going to be difficult. Uh, and I think a lot does hinge on the 2024 presidential election, because if you do have a second Trump administration, I do think uh, South Korea's propensity to take this further will um, grow substantially. Uh, and, you know, then there's the technical component of a lot of this, which is that the South Koreans don't have industrial scale uranium enrichment or plutonium reprocessing capabilities. So in terms of building the bomb, uh, they do have a ways to go, but they do have a tremendous level of scientific and technical expertise in the area of nuclear science. Uh, Japan's a different story, right? You have that public allergy, but you do have elites who see nuclear weapons as potentially important capabilities. And Japan's, of course, sitting on quite a bit of plutonium, uh, unlike South Korea. It's mm -hmm. the only non-nuclear weapon state to uh, reprocess plutonium. Oh, interesting. Okay, I wasn't aware of that detail. But, I mean, we've got, at the moment, I think we've got the 12th summit uh, between Japan and South Korea's presidents mm -hmm. at the moment, or Prime Minister uh, President. I mean, Kishida is on his way out. I think he's stepping down later this yeah. month. I believe. 
So what do you expect? Uh, you know, the Conservatives, I believe, in Japan have been the dominant party. I'm not too uh, in, de- in deeply engrossed in, in Japan's domestic politics, but I tried to follow it on your podcast as much as I can. Um, uh, what could we see shifting, if anything, in, in the discourse uh, with a new leader in Japan, or is it more of a formality than anything? Yeah, so you know, um, just to just to retrace for your listeners a little bit, uh, you know, Japan South Korea relations were in a really bad place just a couple of years ago. Uh, this was when uh, South Korea was uh, led by a progressive government. Uh, progressives generally in South Korea have been rather critical of Japan, uh, view Japan as being insufficiently remorseful for uh, atrocities committed against South Korea during the Second World War. Um, but there were also other incidents, including uh, Japan's decision to effectively economically punish South Korea after a South Korean court found in favor of um, South Korean uh, workers that had been abused by Japanese companies, again, during the colonial occupation, demanding sort of reparations. So there was a, you know, there was a radar lock on incident uh, that also um, set apart um, the two countries. But there's been a lot of work done since then. Uh, You've had a constellation of three leaders, President Biden in the United States, Prime Minister Kishida, and um, President Yoon in South Korea that have been willing to um, move forward trilateral cooperation uh, between between the U.S., Japan, and South Korea, right? These are two separate treaty alliances for the United States, and the U.S. has been really interested in seeing greater integration trilaterally between um, Japan and South Korea, but it's been difficult because of politics. And Kishida right. was uh, originally, you know, he wasn't really rushing into uh, trilateral cooperation with South Korea. In, in Japan, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, the LDP, which has been um, which has ruled Japan for most of its post-war history, uh, has been rather skeptical of um, South Korea and, and South Korea's ability to uh, sustain politically uh, cooperation. But Kishida nevertheless uh, did make advances, right? I think this is also born of a realization in Japan that Japan's security environment has also declined, and it is useful to ultimately deepen relations with South Korea. So the big question now is Prime Minister Kishida sets, um, steps down, and you have a leadership race within the LDP, which will determine who the next Prime Minister of Japan will be. The question is, will whoever takes over for Kishida have that similar approach uh, to sustaining cooperation with South Korea, or or will the, you know or will we see somebody that's more skeptical fundamentally? Now, in South Korea, I think there is still interest in maintaining better ties with Japan, despite how politically toxic that has been in in parts of the South Korean um, polity. Yoon, I think, will continue to uh, invest political capital. Actually, what's been remarkable about him, you know, he's not really a career politician by background. And so he's been willing to really spend tremendous amounts of political capital uh, in pursuing better ties with Japan. And that's been an important priority for the U.S., um, and so I would say, you know, if we get a Harris victory this fall and we get a successor to Kishida who generally sees trilateral cooperation and bilateral cooperation with South Korea as positive, we will see the trend line persist, a trend line that really kind of took off last year with the Camp David summit. Um, but there are potential, of course, for, uh, you know, bumps in the road here. I think the big risk is actually in South Korea with the next election. Uh, if you do have a uh, president in 2027 that is progressive, for instance, I would expect to see uh, a significant loss of momentum in the trilateral cooperation that we're seeing now. Hmm, surprising, considering how much the the White House has put into it. Um, so I want to I want to sort of one last question on sort of East Asia, and then we'll work ourselves down towards sort of Southeast Asia and the SCS and uh, and and things. But um, you know, one of the things that I think is quite uh, notable about this whole thing is the willingness of the US to share uh, certain information, um, and also just generally what we've seen in sort of in great power politics. You know, North Korea was a file. The at least on the Security Council, UN Security Council, you could see the, the big three um, sort of agreeing on that. I remember a statement from Putin like in 2017 sort of saying, you know, he was against new nuclear weapons, more proliferation amongst the North Koreans, right? I, I can't remember exactly what he said, right? But how times have changed. Um, and now this is the, the, the illustration of just how there is no cooperation on anything anymore, even something that the Security Council was largely universally agreed on. Um, what what's your perspective there about how you know our inability to even agree on the most basic sort of treaties anymore and how that's influencing the minds towards sort of shifts in nuclear policy yeah so you know i think i think uh, implicit in your question is uh the idea of a fraying great power consensus on nonproliferation right mm-hmm. i think uh 
during you know the height of the Cold War, uh, beginning in the 1960s, the U.S. and the Soviet Union um, determined uh, initially in the U.S., but later the Soviets agreed with this that a world with more nuclear armed states uh, is is generally bad for both superpowers. Right? It doesn't matter if the countries that have nuclear weapons are friendly, are allies, or are adversaries. Uh, it is it is not a world that either country should want to see. The more fingers on the nuclear button around the world, the less safe the world is overall. You know, the U.S. even had concerns about. Uh, presumably allied states like France um, potentially behaving in crises in ways that could actually stoke nuclear escalation. But mm. in any case, I mean, the point I'm making is that uh, you did have a, uh, over time, a great power consensus that a world where fewer countries had nuclear weapons was a better world. Um, and eventually, you know, China uh, also came around to that in the in the 1990s and, and, and later. Um, but today, I think uh, if you look at how the US, China and Russia um, talk about many of the big questions that affect the non-proliferation regime. You know, everything from Russia deciding to cooperate with North Korea, China being quite critical of AUKUS, for instance, the transfer of um, highly enriched uranium-based uh, naval nuclear reactor units to Australia for uh, conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines, um, and, uh, you know, talk that the United States might conclude a civil nuclear cooperation agreement with Saudi Arabia. Um, you are sort of heading into territory where I think the sense is that the great powers, as they pursue their grand strategies, are unwilling to really place nonproliferation at the top of their national priorities, uh, right? And so this is going to affect how the Security Council, the IAEA, the nonproliferation treaty review process uh, tend to play out. Uh, and I think that has broader effects on the global nuclear order. Um, I, I'm not necessarily saying that the great powers are going to promote proliferation, uh, but there is a sense that non-proliferation, at least, is no longer a key priority. But also the world is changing, right? I mean, North Korea, in my view, uh, for the United States, at least, uh, it, it's not really primarily a non-proliferation problem anymore, right? This is a country that has nuclear weapons. They have delivery systems. So the recommendation that I've made repeatedly over a number of years now is that the U.S. needs to reconceptualize this problem. And the first principle that should guide U.S. policy towards North Korea is not disarming North Korea of nuclear weapons necessarily, because that's not realistic in the short term, uh, but it's about reducing risks and managing risks, like treating North Korea more like we treat Russia and China as nuclear adversaries, right? That's not, it's not a great power, but uh, the taxonomy there, I think, has changed. Um, but the big problem I really do think is Russia, right? I think uh, Russia in many ways has started to behave like a rogue great power, uh, right? They they do have ultimately the status of a great power still in international politics as much as the United States might like to pretend otherwise. Uh, the Russians have nuclear technology. They have massive enrichment capacity. Uh, they have um, a robust defense industrial complex. And so if they do decide to cooperate with countries like Iran, like North Korea, and turn the other cheek and even shelter countries like Iran and North Korea at the UN Security Council, where they do ultimately still wield a veto, uh, that is going to bear, um, you know, that is going to have ripple effects on on the broader uh, global nuclear order, I think. Well, I think it's quite interesting you say that, because I was literally about to sort of put to you the idea that obviously some in the, uh, I mean, I, well, my five years in Washington, there would be plenty of people who would say, well, after Putin's invasion, you know, Russia is no longer a great power because of their inability to exercise, you know, effectively kinetic warfare against a much smaller foe. Um, and that the only thing that makes them quote unquote a great power is because of their nuclear arsenal. But I think some of your counterpoints are, are quite pertinent. Um, I, I do. I'm quite interested, though, for your perspective about the sort of sharing of information when it comes to nuclear capability. Mainly, I'm thinking AUKUS, right? This is the only time that the Americans and the British have been willing to share that kind of information to the Australians, who are one of the closest uh, allies you can think of. Um, uh, and yet you've got South Korea, Japan, who are talking about this, and as we've discussed already. So in your mind, if if there is going to be a normalization towards sort of new nuclear policy, um, is it going to be a case of that we should share this kind of information to sort of pre preemptively do that or as a precaution or i don't know i don't know if my question makes sense but this is obviously is it better to just give that information to allies as a as a sort of deterrence approach um because they're inevitably they're going to want to develop it on their own capabilities or, or what's the best approach there? 
Well, so AUKUS is interesting, right? Because there, it's it's a it's a defense industrial partnership. It's not a trilateral alliance per se. Even though the U.S. does have a treaty commitment to Australia and a treaty commitment to the U.K., the U.S. and the U.K. have a mutual defense agreement that includes really exceptional forms of information sharing. And AUKUS doesn't actually do that, right? The Australians don't get to look at the isotopic composition of the highly enriched uranium nuclear fuel within the sealed reactor units that are going to be delivered. Um, the real purpose of AUKUS, at least pillar one of AUKUS, which is the submarine piece, uh, is to enable this capability for the Australians and to do what it takes to make sure that the submarines can be delivered. Uh, the UK will be building SSN AUKUS with the Australians and the US will be transferring um, Virginia class uh, American uh, nuclear propelled submarines to the Australians as, uh, as an initial step. But um, what AUKUS has done, though, I think it has sort of cut back against commitments made by the U.S. and the U.K., including in the context of the G7, to minimize uh, the use of highly enriched uranium around the world. Right. This is part of broader nuclear security efforts to uh, to promote nonproliferation by de-emphasizing the use of HEU. But now literal <laughs> literal truckloads of HEU will be making their way to Australia to enable these uh, these submarines. So that has gotten some criticism. Right. I think I think. Technically speaking, I do find much of the Chinese critique of AUKUS to be um, somewhat besides the point, right? I think the the concern that we've heard from China in various forums is that AUKUS undercuts Australia's non-proliferation commitments because it will make the possibility of Australia building nuclear weapons more likely. And I just don't think that that's true, right? Australia does not have... Uh, they won't be enriching in connection with AUKUS. They're not going to have the ability to extract that fuel, right? You'd have to essentially destroy the submarines. You'd have to take the irradiated fuel out, reprocess it. So, I mean, it's it's not something where the Australians can really just pull this stuff out and build nuclear weapons if they needed to. Um, but it does raise some of those questions. And then on, on information sharing, you know, the other kind of information sharing the U.S. has been really big on in the Indo-Pacific, mostly with South Korea now, where uh, the U.S. set up a nuclear consultative group last year, uh, is talking to allies more about U.S. nuclear capabilities, right? And that's about yeah. the kinds of nuclear weapons the U.S. has, U.S. nuclear capability doctrine, the South Koreans have wanted reassurances that the U.S. would be willing to respond with nuclear weapons if North Korea used nuclear weapons. And the U.S. hasn't been able to give that as a blanket assurance. And there's reasons for that that we can get into mostly has to do with the law of armed conflict and the fact that only the president of the United States can make the decision to use nuclear weapons. But um, the broader approach on information sharing, I think, has been fairly useful. The South Koreans, I think, have found the nuclear consultative group process to be reassuring in 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 the broader sense, even though it hasn't completely solved uh, the assurance problems for the alliance, right? Assurance is almost, uh, it's it, it's a never-ending project. It's a garden that must be tended essentially forever uh, because allies never feel fully, fully secure despite what the U.S. does. Um, but I think those are um, increasingly going to be a big component of how U.S. Um, talks to allies in this part of the world. Uh, and so, you know, a little bit of a different issue between AUKUS and uh, the nuclear consultative group there. No, certainly. And, and we've sort of started off, as I said, in East Asia, and we've gone down to Australasia, and now we're coming back into the SES. But like, obviously, the, the elephant in the room being China, AUKUS is, well, it's nothing to do with China, neither is the Quad, clearly. Um, but one of the things I'm very curious for your perspective on is this uh, increasingly what well, I think most people would agree is a de departure from Beijing of minimal deterrence. Um, because for what well, for the much of its should we say power status as a nuclear power, China's followed this this approach, this strategy. But we've seen those satellite imagery of the of the um, silos. Of course, that doesn't mean that they have literally got the new stockpiles or more stockpiles. But the point is that it does look like China is taking more of a shift away from minimal deterrence. Is that just generally reflective of the world that we're in now? Is there a longer term? feeling that they need it because if they want to be really considered a, a true superpower to rival that in the United States, what's going on in the psyche in Beijing? Yeah. So, you know, uh, I mean, th the answer to your question is that we don't really know, right? Because Xi Jinping has not given a speech where he explains or even acknowledges, right? China doesn't publicly acknowledge that they're undertaking a nuclear buildup right now. Um, you know, the U.S. Department of Defense uh, thinks that China will have a thousand warheads by 2030, uh, maybe 1500 by 2035 if current production patterns keep up. That represents a more than fivefold increase from where China was just in 2019 when the Defense Intelligence Agency of the U.S. said that China had a nuclear arsenal that numbered in the low 200s of, of nuclear warheads. 
um, I think I think the way to kind of uh, talk about this is is really to acknowledge that there are there are multiple hypotheses that could explain these, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? I think you alluded to one, which is you know Xi Jinping talks about China having a world class military. Uh, this has been a big emphasis um, under under Xi's idea of a Chinese dream of of, of a sort of national rejuvenation, and so on on. In, in a very simple sense, uh, there could simply be the belief that, you know, a great power with a world class military uh, has a nuclear arsenal that numbers in the four days. Right. I'm not saying that's that's the full story here. Right. I think I think there are more strategic ways to also read this. Right. China could be generally perceiving a more dangerous world, a world more primed for conflict with the United States. Uh, and the assumption might be that China needs a larger, more survivable nuclear force to humble the United States, right? If the, if the U.S. might perceive itself to have substantial room for maneuver in a crisis over Taiwan or a crisis in the South China Sea, uh, because China has a more limited, smaller nuclear arsenal, right? The, the Chinese have had concerns for a number of years that the U.S. might seek to disarm them of their nuclear weapons using not only U.S. nuclear weapons, but even advanced conventional weapons. And the U.S. has made a lot of advances here. Uh, you know, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty ended in 2019, so the U.S. is now deploying more uh, conventional uh, precision strike systems to the Indo-Pacific. That's been a big part of what's happened uh, in the last five years. American allies are getting more capable. So for all of these reasons, China might see a larger nuclear arsenal as a lot more survivable. Uh, and then, you know, I mean, to, without getting too wonky, there's also other hypotheses that bear mentioning. You know, one is about escalation control and theater deterrence. We see a lot of evidence that China's buildup, uh, including acknowledged parts of the Chinese buildup and what the Chinese have been doing. Uh, in 2019, they had a military parade where they showed off a new hypersonic system that's designed for regional targets. Uh, they have a intermediate range missile system known as the DF-26, which is a dual capable missile system as well, um, very much focused on uh, targets in the Indo-Pacific, most notably Guam, which is an important uh, logistics mm -hmm. and staging node for the United States to, to sustain conventional military operations uh, in, in Asia as well. So I think a mix of these factors is going on. But I think one thing to also emphasize is that I think Xi Jinping, as a leader, uh, you know, as paramount leader of China, substantially, I think he is substantially different from pretty much every preceding paramount leader, going all the way back to Mao. Right? Mao fundamentally did not view nuclear weapons as anything more than political tools for China. The reason China built nuclear weapons was due to American nuclear coercion in the 1950s during the Korean War and the first and second Taiwan Straits crises. Uh, and, and since then, that's really been sustained, right? The Chinese have been focused on effective counterattack. They've maintained a declaratory policy of no first use, indicating to the world that they would expect to absorb a nuclear attack and then retaliate with whatever forces they could um, ride out that attack with. Um, that has now changed. And I think China is getting, um, is starting to resemble the US and Russia uh, in a lot more ways. You know, you resembled, um, you referenced the silo fields. And I think that's perhaps the best example. We, we are seeing China build these massive fields of silos for intercontinental range ballistic missiles that very much resemble the traditional approach that the U.S. and Russia have taken. And I think that also enables uh, a potential departure from their traditional nuclear policy, uh, especially, you know, uh, no first use. I think there's been a lot of debates over the year about uh, over the years about how serious are the Chinese about no first use. I think increasingly the evidence we see is that China may be willing to adopt um, a posture where they at least have the option to reuse nuclear weapons first, right? One of the things that silos allow for is launch on warning, which is uh, effectively, if, uh, you know, China has a lot more satellites now. If they can see an incoming attack from the United States against China, they could potentially launch their nuclear capable systems before they're destroyed in an attack. This is similar to the option that the United States maintains uh, as well. No, well, okay, that's well. It's these kinds of technical details that you know I I, I follow it from a grand strategy and mm -hmm. sort of geopolitical emphasis, but uh, technicalities like that are, are fascinating. Uh, just a little bit more, actually, because for me the composition of it is actually quite interesting. From what I understand, the Russians have about sixteen, seventeen hundred uh, nuclear de weapons deployed strategically, and then there's what like twenty five hundred in reserves or non-deployed the u.s quite similar i think you know you're talking maybe a couple hundred give or take on either side china from what i understand they had like 270 um prior to the, obviously this this likely proliferation but most of them if not all were non-deployed or reserve um is that has that shifted completely now or what's what's generally sort of the composition of the three big players um yeah, well 
Yeah, you know, with the U.S. and Russia, uh, you know, we we do still have central limits uh, on strategic forces uh, right. pursuant to arms control agreements. So the the New START treaty, which was uh, agreed in 2010 and signed in 2011, um, limits both countries to 1,550 strategic deployed warheads. Uh, you know, without getting too technical, there's a weird quirk in the treaty about how bomber based weapons are counted. Regardless of the number of um, actual bombs or missiles that go on a bomber, each bomber counts as one warhead. And so the numbers, practically speaking, for strategic forces are in the high 1,000s for both Russia and the United States, with a little bit of a difference depending on how you count the bombers, but 1,550 according to the treaty counting rules. Right. Um, the, uh, the Russians have a very large arsenal of non-strategic nuclear weapons, uh, more than 2,000 uh, compared to the United States, which has a much smaller number. Uh, the Russians rely on those weapons a lot more, although they don't deploy them uh, in uh, in kind of a, a forward deployed mode like they might have done during the Cold War. They keep these weapons in central storage. Now you talk yeah. about China, and I think you uh, you know the deployed versus non deployed thing can get a little technical, right? So technically speaking, China's nuclear arsenal. If you use the same arms control counting rules as the U.S. and Russia apply to each other, then yes, most of China's weapons would not be deployed. Uh, you know, one of the ways in which China used to make its no first use policy credible to the outside world was that they would actually um, demonstrate through exercises that they would often televise uh, that their warheads and their delivery systems were demated, right? So in a crisis, they would have to move the warheads onto the missiles so they could use them. And, you know, that does help make no first use more credible because the u.s i mean you know we have icbms and silos with warheads uh 24 7 um ready to be released on fairly short notice uh if the president does decide that that is necessary uh china does not do that but now you know as i described china's forces are changing so as they move towards deploying these large-scale silo fields and you know china has had silos before but they had a fairly small arsenal of largely uh, liquid-fueled silo-based missiles. And now they're deploying solid propellant missiles. These are, you know, without getting, again, too technical, these missiles can be launched without necessarily being fueled in a crisis. Uh, and so that does uh, increase the availability of nuclear weapons uh, for prompt use by China in a crisis. So all of these, all of these changes are happening. Uh, but, you know, there is still a difference because um, China, even if it builds up to 1,500, uh, is going to still be a little bit short of where the U.S. and Russia are, right? So uh, the term that gets used in the the jargon of the nuclear policy field is whether whether or not China is a nuclear peer. Uh, I think near peer is where China is going. That is not a peer today. China has about 500 nuclear warheads as of the last uh, unclassified Department of Defense estimate. But this is changing. Uh, and then the big question is, you know, our uh, new start, that arms control agreement I described, uh, that agreement expires in February 2026. Uh, Putin actually suspended the agreement last year, and the U.S. had since um, rolled back some of the transparency measures that the agreement accounts for. But both the U.S. and Russia have pledged to observe the central limits, that 1550 number, until February 2026. What happens after that, I think, is a really big question, right? Will the U.S. choose to build up its nuclear arsenal? We have non-deployed warheads that could be uploaded on submarines, on ICBMs. That is where we start getting into the territory of a, a new arms race, an arms race that uh, many, I think, in Washington would argue China and Russia have already entered. Uh, and now the question is, what will the U.S. do about this? Curious if we won. I mean, I... I, I... I'm always a little bit skeptical of this whole idea of Cold War 2.0, mainly because China's not the Soviet Union um, economically. And well, just yeah, it's it's. I, I find the comparison a little bit overstretched. But if we are entering a sort of new arms race, then maybe it's more pertinent. But um, I've got two more questions. Penultimate one being, you've sort of alluded to it, which is the communications element in this. Obviously, the balloon last year was bizarre aside from many other uh, you know words i can use to describe it but something that became quite apparent is the lack of crisis communications between beijing and dc um and what we've uh, there was a very good piece in the financial times about sort of these secret strategic meetings uh, that sullivan the you know national security advisor has been taking to beijing and meeting with Wang Yi and, and and similar to try to sort of as preliminary to biden and g meeting or blinken and whoever meeting um what's the situation there in the context of nuclear uh, policy um do beijing and uh dc have as comprehensive sort of do they have the red telephone uh, to put it in simple terms for the for listeners um or, or things getting worse 
<laughs> no, so they don't, right? And and I think uh, this has been a big focus for the Biden administration that has uh, adopted the language of responsible competition with China, uh, indicating that right. the two countries are in a systemic competition, uh, but they have a certain responsibility as nuclear armed states to uh, put guardrails essentially on that. That is literally the term that you know Jake Sullivan and many in the Biden administration have used. China doesn't really love that framing, right? Because I think the guardrails approach for China is a moral hazard issue. Essentially, they see that the U.S. wants guardrails or the U.S. wants communication measures so the U.S. can you know, continue doing freedom of navigation operations, flying near China's airspace without necessarily perceiving greater risk. And I think for China, it's this idea that uh, you know, it's this idea that if you wear a seatbelt, you're going to drive less responsibly necessarily, right? And so I think they they take a similar approach to uh, fairly, you know, turning a cold shoulder when the U.S. advocates for better crisis communications. And that also extends to calls by the Biden administration for China to explore arms control talks with the United States. There is an interest there. China perceives itself to be inferior to the United States with its nuclear forces and so it values opacity uh, as a means of enhancing its survivability for its nuclear forces. They're not wrong about that, right? I mean, the data of course, it shows that China does have a smaller, less survivable nuclear force than the U.S. But over time, given the probability of conventional war between the two countries growing, uh, this is going to be, I think, an urgent priority uh, for the two sides to at least figure out crisis communications. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, what the balloon incident and some other incidents show us is that China is actually primed to not pick up the phone when times are difficult. And I think that may have to do a lot with bureaucratic quirks within, in terms of how the Chinese system works. There isn't really a culture of you know, uh, allowing lower level parts of the bureaucracy or even the military, you know, the Southern Theater Command, the PLA or the Eastern Theater Command aren't going to be freelancing in military crisis communications with uh, their American counterparts without necessarily getting high level political guidance that may have to go all the way up to the Central Military Commission, uh, given how uh, centralized things have come under Xi Jinping's leadership in particular. So I think this is going to be a uh, an issue that the next administration will inherit in the United States, trying to get China more interested in um, talking and at least keeping channels open, if not moving towards more formal arms control. Okay. And the last question I have for you is, you wrote a rather interesting piece, or there was a piece you were involved with um, about uh, is red is India ready to launch? I think this was in April of this year, and obviously I started off this podcast so we're coming full circle about the Indo-Pacific element in this. But I want to tag on also Taiwan because I don't think any conversation with, about China without referencing Taiwan at all would be uh, uh, do justice. But basically, these two entities. India obviously is part of the Quad. It's something that I think the US is increasingly betting on as being a critical partner in any kind of scenario in the in this part of the world. Um, what's their general situation when it comes to well, what's their nuclear strategy basically? Um, but the second prong to that is where do nukes come in with Taiwan? You know, there's been rumblings that maybe some will be put in Taiwan or Taiwan wants some. Uh, I know they're not really connected, but I'd be curious for your quick takes on both of those factors. Yeah, so let's start with Taiwan, right? I mean, um, the Taiwanese had a nuclear program after the alliance with the United States ended after normalization. The U.S. put that program back in the box, right? So, so Taiwan is uh, is not, a, you know, they're not going to have nuclear weapons anytime soon. But the but the main role is that um, the main role of nuclear weapons is really in high intensity conventional war fighting between China and the U.S., where the possibility of nuclear escalation will linger. Uh, and so, for a long time, uh, a lot of war games in D.C. would uh, effectively leave out nuclear weapons from a U.S.-China scenario over Taiwan when, you know, we tried to game out how uh, how well the U.S. conventional military would fare. But I think that's those days are over, right? I think the U.S. and China are going to be, if they are ever implicated, implicated in a conflict or serious crisis, there will be a nuclear shadow over that. And I think that's just undeniable. Uh, and increasingly, uh, a lot of my work is focused on um, thinking through the ways in which high-intensity high conventional operations uh, by the United States, by Japan, by Australia, by allied countries um, against China could actually create the conditions for nuclear escalation. That's a very, very important set of questions that I think we just haven't thought enough about. Right. Um, and then India, you know, India, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, the U.S. has made this bet on India now for <laughs> really um, you know, more than 20 years. Uh, and I, I think, you know, you could fairly make the case that that bet has not necessarily paid off in quite the way that the U.S. might have hoped, right? Uh, you know, is India a maritime power or a fundamentally land-oriented power? Uh, I think in Washington, there's been this aspiration that the Indo-Pacific, which is very much a maritime concept, requires an India that is willing to treat 
the maritime commons of the Indian Ocean as its primary strategic consideration. But that's not what you get if you go to New Delhi, right? I mean, India is still fundamentally oriented towards its northern land borders with Pakistan and China. Uh, the bulk of Indian defense spending uh, is on the army and the air force to maintain deterrence uh, of, of China and Pakistan. India has actually adapted its conventional posture to focus more on China and less on Pakistan since 2020, when India and China had a major clash. Mm-hmm. Um, the Indians also don't make any assurances about assisting the United States. I mean, you know, they're not a partner um, in, in really that deepest way. They are a major defense partner of the United States, so they're increasingly able to access defense technology cooperation with the U.S. Um, closer to the level of an ally uh, than otherwise. But of course, I think the Russia-Ukraine war has also shown that India does continue to pursue its own strategic autonomy uh, in a way that I think has been surprising to many Americans that perhaps haven't been willing to fully contend with the fact that India does have a long-standing bureaucratic and, and, and strategic cultural relationship with Russia uh, and, and a relationship there born of pragmatism, right? Lots of spare parts and maintenance for Soviet origin uh, material operated by the Indian Armed Forces. Um, and that has kept India closer to Russia as well. Uh, so limitations there. You asked a bit about India's nuclear strategy. I mean, lots of anxiety in India about the Chinese buildup, but India is not going to compete quantitatively. Uh, I think we are seeing qualitative adaptations. There's modernization underway in India. They're deploying sea-based nuclear forces. Uh, they just tested an ICBM with multiple Reentry vehicles, multiple warheads, which is supposed to enhance their uh, deterrence um, or their retaliatory ca- capability against China. But uh, we shouldn't expect to see India size up its forces in a big way. They are growing very slowly, uh, but there are real financial and um, material constraints for for New Delhi and how they choose to uh, adapt to this new nuclear age uh, in the Indo Pacific. Well, from Pyongyang to New Delhi, it's been quite a, a roller coaster of conversation there. But Ankit, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Everyone, you've been listening to a conversation with Ankit Panda, a Stanton Senior Fellow, Nuclear Policy Program at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and uh, host of the Age Geopolitics podcast. Some of which the links will be in the description below. And as always, I wish you peace of mind, particularly in this case of conversation. Um, hopefully we can all sleep at night. But uh, as always, see you in the next one and uh, take care.